you doing, Chase? Hey, how's it going, Kelly? Welcome here, man. I got your emails. I'm glad to talk with you. Hope you're doing good. Yeah, I gotta say, I was. I'm a little scared to jump on. I'm all, I'm new to this stuff, so don't be scared. Yeah. <laughs> Come in peace. Cool. Um, so I just want to say, I think, um, as a Latter Day Saint, I can confidently say that uh, Christ and the Father are both eternal. Um, I know you say a lot that that Joseph Smith taught that they weren't, and you do quote the King Follett discourse, correct? Yeah, I do, about. and also um, the Church of Jesus Christ Latter Day Saint quotes it as well. Oh, okay. do you have your YouTube going? Just hit mute. Hit mute on your YouTube. So there's, yeah, there's sound. That's better. Okay, good job. You still there? Oh, Chase, are you there with me? Chase, are you there with me? Hello? Yeah. yeah. So, so you, if you have your YouTube station, YouTube station uh, up, 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 just mute, mute, mute the sound, sound on YouTube. YouTube. No, I'm on my phone, and the YouTube's off now. Well, I'm hearing well, myself talk. Okay. okay. So, How about I'll just mute myself when you start talking. <laughs> oh, that's why, because you got your phone. Oh, I got you. Okay, okay. All right. Well, um, so yeah, so here, I'll, we'll just kind of go back and forth. So yeah, so like this is one among many books that um, the church um, teaches. There's many references in the in here about Joseph Smith, his teaching from um, there. Um, other books um, say something like gospel principles. I've got a whole bunch of books behind me. So the point is, is that even though what's called the History of the Church, Volume 6, the King Follett Discourse, even though that's not like technically inspired scripture, Joseph Smith claimed that what he was going to be teaching would prove he was a true servant of God compared to false teachers. And so the church and new like countless publications quotes these things over and over and over. So if they can quote it as authority for truth, then someone myself who's not a latter saint, I can also quote it in regards to challenging what Joseph Smith in fact taught. Well, when I read the King Follett Discourse, all I read is that he's teaching that the Father took on a body in the same way that, that Jesus did. Because even in the King Follett Discourse, he refers to the Father as the head God. And all he says is that, not all he says, but what he's referring to is that Jesus only did what he saw the Father do. And in that, the, that the Father must have taken a body upon himself and had a mortal existence similar to ours. So when he's saying that God was once a man like us, he's saying, yes, in the way that we are, but that doesn't mean he wasn't perfect and eternally God in the same way that Jesus was. So, uh, oh, hear myself again. Um, uh, thanks, yeah, for sharing. So just trying to keep it simple. I don't want to talk too long because of the, the volume thing going on there. So let me just give you a quick, quick reference here. And I'll, let me just read it for a second and quote it to you. And then you can give a response, okay? Let me just quote it here for you. All right. I'm set, this is page 305 at the top. Joe Smith says, I will prove that the world is wrong by showing what God is. I'm going to inquire after God. I want you all to know him and be familiar with him. And if I'm bringing to you a knowledge of him, all persecutions against me ought to cease. You will then know that I am his servant, for I speak as one having authority. And let me just back up a moment, because what he said prior, he also said, uh, just in page three or four, just before this, I forgot to read this. If I sh uh, show verily that I have the truth of God and show that 99 out of 100 professing religious ministers are false teachers having no authority while they pretend to be ministers are false teachers. Sorry, while they pretend to hold the keys of the kingdom on earth. And then was to, you know, I won't get read the rest, but anyway, he's, he's, he's challenging Christians, prove them wrong. And then he says, I'm going to prove to you the whole world wrong by who God is. And he goes on to say, I'm going to go back to the beginning before the world was to show what kind of being God is. What sort of being was God in the beginning? Open your ears and hear, all ye ends of the earth. For I'm going to prove it to you by the Bible and tell you the designs of God in relation to the human race and why he interferes in matters. God himself was once as we are now. 
an exalted man, sits enthroned in yonder heavens. That is the great secret. If the veil were rent today, and the great God who holds this world in its orbit, and who upholds all the worlds and all the things by his power, was to make himself visible, I say, if you were to see him today, you would see him like a man in a, in a form. Like yourselves, in all person, image, very form as a man, for Adam was created in the very fashion, image and likeness of God. And we received from and walked and talked and conversed with him as one man talks and communes with another. So I keep reading here. These are, are inc incomprehensible ideas to some, but they are simple. It is the first principle of the gospel. Listen, it is the first principle of the gospel to know for certainty the character of God and to know that we may converse with him as one man converses with another. That he was once a man like all of us, the Father who dwelt on the earth, the same Jesus Christ himself is dead. So he goes on just basically saying, like, over and over and over, he's proving that God was not always God, as the Bible teaches from all eternity. So when you really examine that for what he claimed, um, he's basically saying that God was not always God. Same thing would apply to Jesus. He wasn't always God as well. So at some point, God the Father was not God the Father. Therefore, he wasn't God. He became God. Same with all the gods before. So this is a, a huge teaching that goes against what the Old Testament taught, what the New Testament taught. And honestly, I don't know how many videos you've seen of mine, but I've done quite a few videos in the past where there are many references, even in the Book of Mormon, that unequivocally state that God's been God from all eternity. So the, the problem is Joseph Smith is contradicting a lot of things pertaining to um, what the, the scriptures teach. Go ahead. Yeah, um, thanks for pointing out that in the Book of Mormon there is a lot of references to them both being one eternal God. Um, and that's why I think when I read the King Fallout Discourse, I come from that frame of mind because that came beforehand and future revelation can't um, contradict previous revelation. So like what you just read from the King Fallout Discourse, all I hear is that Father was once an, he is an exalted man in the same way that Jesus is. Uh, but that doesn't negate that they could have been gods from eternity. So I guess we just have different perspectives on the discourse, but I'll definitely study it some more and try and see it from a different point of view. And Let me read one more quote here. Uh, this was this was the middle quote. I was just I was kind of just hitting a couple highlights there. I didn't want to read the whole thing, right? But um, I appreciate your you know your your what's the word candor. I'm really enjoying talking with you, Chase. Um, here's the here's the middle part here. In order to understand the subject of the dead, for the consolation of those who mourn for the loss of their friends, it is necessary we should understand the character and being of God. So here's what he said. It is necessary we understand the character and being of God and how he came to be so. For I am going to show you how God came to be God. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea, take away the veil so that you may see. So here's one quick statement right here. He says that, you know, we, we, we believe that he's always been God from everlasting. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take away that veil. I'm going to show you that that's not true, right? And that's where he goes on to say that, God was once a man who became a God. So that's, I hear where you're coming from. What you're saying, I understand what you're saying, but that's not what actually Joseph Smith is teaching. He's teaching something different than what you're saying. Yeah, that's a good point. And I would say that sentence there is kind of hard to square with the whole thing, but um, I'll read about it more. Thanks. Hey, I do have a question for you. Um, on a different note, um, about John 17, 20 through 22, when Jesus is praying to the Father um, that the apostles may become one in him as he is one in the Father. Um, how do you interpret that as a Trinitarian, from a Trinitarian perspective? You said John 17, 17 through 22? 20 through 22, yeah. 
I'm just going to read it out loud here. Uh, Sanctify them through thy truth. I'm reading the King James. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, and no, not in, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So one of the things I would say here, let me see if I need to keep reading or if that's good enough here. I think that's probably good. So your question is a good one. So the question is really on the word one, and also you asked on how the Trinity could work, particularly to these verses. One of the things, I'll just kind of make a quick statement here, is the triunity or the Trinity, where at least this is one thing that the LDS and you and myself would have agreement in this area. We both believe that Jesus is not the Father, and the Father is not Jesus. They're distinct from one are the same also with the Holy Spirit, right? So the distinction here is, okay, well, how are they one, right? What does it mean to be one, and how are we one as, as people, as people with, with the Father and the Son, right? In other places, the same word one is used in numerous places, say, for example, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 13, and other places where it says that there is one church, one body of Christ, but yet we're many members, right? So the word one, same word, is used both in the singular, singular, but also can be used as a unity, right? Prior to this here in John 17, John 17 is kind of a, it starts really in 13, and it goes 14, 15, 16, and 17. This is the whole shebang where Jesus is teaching his disciples. So it's kind of a a whole message together, right? Well, in John 14, I just want to back up a couple of chapters because this is this is all together. It's not just one, a few verses. It's all together. So notice in John 14, look at verse, um, well, there's numerous, but I'll go to verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man loveth me, he will keep my words. My father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So it shows how both the Father and the Son will come out, somehow make their abode with us, right? Or those of us who are, um, you know, born-again Christians, right? If you go back a few verses, and even go back to um, verse 16. Actually, no, we'll go back a couple of verses here. Sorry. I want to give context. So in the context of John 14... Philip asked Jesus in verse 8, show us the Father, right? We, we want to know who this Father is, right? And in verse 9, Jesus said unto him, Have I been with you so long, yet hast, not, hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. How saith thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou? Thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. So the Father dwells in, the, in Jesus, and he does the works. Verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. So we see what's going on here is that, Somehow, I don't fully grasp this, somehow in their special relationship and how they are divine, the Father can be in Jesus and Jesus can be in the Father, but yet they are distinct still from one another. And then when Jesus keeps on going, John 6, uh, 14, 16, 
Jesus says, I will pray that the Father, he will give you another helper or another comforter that he may be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him for he dwelleth with you. That word with is like alongside and shall be in you. So what's interesting about this, this is one of the first places we see Jesus teaching and speaking about this Holy Spirit. Who is this Holy Spirit? What's interesting, Chase, is also this part here says, well, that word another, another comforter, that Greek word another is the Greek word alos, which means to be another of the same kind or another of the same nature. So whoever Jesus was by nature, this spirit of truth, this comforter to come, he would also be in like manner, right? So then when you get to the John 17 here, I just wanted to kind of back up. There's more that I could share, but that's just a little bit. So when you're reading John 17 and it's kind of concluding, we need to realize that Jesus was already in numerous places in, the, in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and then concluding in 17, teaching many things about who he was, who the Father was, and then John 14, 15, and 16 is the most information we ever read about the Holy Spirit, particularly from Jesus. So back to what you're asking here in John 17, how, how it says here, particularly, neither I, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, even thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that thou also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, the glory which thou gavest me, I give unto them, that they may be one, even as they are one. So he's speaking future tense. So... In a special way, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have this eternal relationship with one another. What's amazing, though, is for those of us who would put our complete trust in Jesus Christ as death, burial, and resurrection, we become born again and become true followers of him. Somehow in all of that, we now become a part of the body of Christ. We are now one with him in some kind of unique way, but we are not like like gods or anything like divine. I don't think you're implying that, but there's some kind of special relationship where we are one together as a family with him and Jesus, the father and the spirit have an eternal relationship with one another. So I don't know if that helps or makes it more confusing, but the, 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 the short answer is when you're reading that you've got 13, 14, 15, 16 and 17, all of the, a unit together. So you can't just say, well, where is the Trinity here in just these verses? You take it together, this whole message that he was teaching his disciples. Okay, cool. Thank you. So when he says things like, they may be one, even as we are one, he's not referring to them being one being? No. Okay. And here, that's a good point that you bring up, Chase. Um, I think maybe not, you know, you or directly or whatever, but there are people who will, will say, how can one, like, literal personage, one being, be three, right? Nod your head if you know what I mean by that, right? So this is a misconception, I think, when we read the Old Testament and when we read the New Testament, when we hear the word one. I'll give you an example. Are you married? Okay, you will be hopefully one day, I'm assuming, <laughs> right? That's your, that's your hope. So imagine one day you're married. Well, the Bible says in Genesis 2, 24, that the man and the woman are one flesh, right? So they are one flesh. Well, it doesn't mean, uh, this is my joke, it doesn't mean that you, 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 husband and wife are literally like attached together with two physical bodies, walking down the street with four arms and four legs and two heads and looks like some kind of crazy thing, right? So the word one, a lot of times in the Old Testament, is used uh, both in the singular, but also as a unity. So when we look at how God is described as one God, it's kind of in a similar way as I was sharing earlier. There's one church. There's one body of Christ. So we, we don't, don't look at it as like singular numeral uno, like a number. Look at it as a, as a totality, like as, as a unit, right? And in that, then there are many. So kind of like example with a family. If you have one family, 
Well, in the language, we say one family. Well, we know easily that if there's more than one person, is, you've got a unity or many, many members, right? So if you have one family, you have, nobody's going to think it's only one person, is, right? One, one literal being person kind of thing, right? So I think there's a misconception, and I've talked about this numerous times with many different people. There's a misconception when you say God is one. Um, and there's no scripture in the Old Testament. I challenge any Jewish person, any Muslim, anyone else have to provide any scripture that says God is only one person. It's, you'll never find that. But you'll see scripture say there's one God, God is one, or things like that. But it has the meaning of nature or substance, right? So the Father's always been. I don't fully understand that. Jesus has always been. I don't fully understand that. The Bible teaches the Holy Spirit is eternal. I don't fully understand that as well. However, God has always been, just because my brain doesn't comprehend that, does not make it any less true what the Bible teaches. Now, now, if there was something in the Bible that would go against that, then that's where my I would have to challenge that, right? But as a person who wants to believe what the Bible teaches, to believe it's inspired, to believe it's true, to believe it has history, it has evidence, culture, archaeology, all these different things, I first go at it looking at, okay, what does it say? And then how am I going to try to want to understand what's being said? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I'm still, I feel like I'm still trying to get a full grasp on what the Trinity is and the doctrine of it. Um, holy, I'm trying, but it still just seems pretty incomprehensible to me. Well, tell me from your point of view, you, could you mention you've, you've only been a Latter-day Saint for just over a year, right? What were you before that? Were, were you anything before that? No. So my parents were Latter-day Saints, but we became inactive when I was, before I was baptized. And then I pretty much went full atheist in high school. And um, then when I got in college, I had a pretty long search and about, Two or three years later, I was baptized into LDS Church back in August of 2020. Okay. So your, your parents are obviously LDS and all that, yeah? Cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, so, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of questions I could, say, I could easily say on your end where you're coming from because as, as you mentioned, like you were growing up, you really weren't much, you were an atheist, you, you kind of were inactive, all that. And so you have lots of questions, things like that. And then you kind of now brought back into the LDS, you know, faith, church and all that. And then there's lots of questions, right? So what I would suggest, because obviously it's not going to happen like, you know, like that. What I would love to do with you, and it's like just an open invitation. You know what? We don't have to be live, but, you know, you're always welcome to come on here. But if you want to talk on the phone one day or we could do Messenger by Facebook and we just have like just a normal civil conversation and you ask me questions, you know what, I, 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 I'm being recorded right now, I'll, I'll be up front, I will not attack you, I will not belittle you, I will not be rude to you, I'll just talk with you, answer your questions the best I can, and we can just kind of, you know, just, just go at it and have a, a good conversation. Sure, yeah, that sounds good, appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. cool. Well, send me an email, and, uh, well, I got your email. <laughs> I'll be in touch with you. All right. Sounds good, Kelly. Thank you for coming on. Absolutely. Have a good one.